literature is not written in English. Okay. Continental literature is not written in English. It is written by non-English European authors in their own languages. Later, it has been translated into English language or in many other languages. And we are reading English translation. This play, Adults House, was written in Norwegian language and the Gibson was a Norwegian dramatist. And he wrote in his own language. Later, it has been translated into many different languages of the world. Even this drama has been translated into Bangla. I think it has been translated, in, translated into all languages of the world. You will not find a country where the people uh, have not read this drama in their own language. We are reading this drama in English translation. And again, different uh, people have translated this drama. We are uh, using a translation that has been done by William Archer. I'm using the text translated by William Archer. You'll also buy this book if you want to follow me. You will find other translations also in our country. But this is one of the best translations. It has been able to uh, represent the original message authentically. Okay, the translator has not deviated mass from the original text, and that he has been tried to he has tried to be as authentic as faithful to the message given by Henry Gibson in his play. So this is a good translation. If possible, you will buy this translation. It also was translated by William Archer. This play was written in 1879, almost 140 years back this play was written. And since then, it has been popular to the people across the world. And the popularity of this drama has not decreased even a bit. Rather, every day, the popularity of this drama is increasing. It is, um, I have already said most frequently, uh, drama is chased drama across the world. Even perhaps Shakespeare's Hamlet has not been staged as many times as a doll's house has been staged. No other play, uh, no play of Shakespeare has been staged as many times as a doll's house. Many people are saying that. They are saying that Henry Gibson's A Doll's House has been staged so many times that even it surpasses the um, frequency of the performance of plays of Shakespeare. But he is not as mass, sorry, as popular or as famous um, a dramatist as Shakespeare was. But next to Shakespeare, you can call him a famous dramatist. He, this drama is a popular drama uh, for one particular reason. Henry Gibson has told the story of a woman told the story of the suffering of a woman. And this woman was a victim of, of the cruelties of male-dominated society. Okay, Henry Gibson in this drama tells the story of the sufferings of a woman. And the story gradually has become the story of the suffering of every woman in the world. And it's not that Henry Gibson is talking or telling this a story of the suffering of one particular woman if you look at yourself, if you look at other women, even look at the women of our society, you'll see that Henry Gibson, so this story has told the story of almost every woman of the world. So that is why everybody feels interested in this story. And every woman finds himself presented in this drama. When we are reading the play, especially when a girl, when a woman, married woman reads the play, Many of the married women have the feeling that they are not different from the married women whose story has been narrated in this play. That is why it has been so popular across the world. Okay. In this drama, this woman protests the patriarchal society. Okay. He revolts against her husband and leaves her husband goes away to establish her as a human being. She says that she would not be anybody's wife. She would not be anybody's mother. She will establish her first as a human being. 
unable to tolerate the cruelty of her husband, unable to tolerate the misbehavior of her husband. Finally, she leaves her husband and goes out of her husband's home, never to come back to her husband. Rather, she has a decision that she will establish herself as a human being. So that was very challenging and was something that was not uh, seen or expected or imagined by anybody in that time. When Henry Gibson wrote this play, he wrote this play in 1879. It was a time when the feminist movement was not in so strong footing as it is now. The women were not at the time uh, conscious as much as women have become today conscious. The women at the time did not think that they were being tortured or they were being deprived of the things that women should have as human beings. They didn't have any such feeling. But Henry Gibson brought this issue before the people and showed people that it is a serious issue. Henry Gibson was um, an unconventional uh, author. Okay, He was not like the traditional authors. He, from the very beginning of his uh, career, was a bit unconventional. He was telling stories of some problems or some issues that people did not take so seriously. Henry Gibson is the first man who is bringing this issue before the people and he's presenting the issue in such a way that the people see that it was a problem. But people, uh, before Henry Gibson brought this issue to their notice, did not think that it was at all a problem, it was at all an issue. When Henry Gibson is presenting this issue in his play, when people see it, they see that it is a serious problem. But before Henry Gibson presenting it, it did never appear to people that it was at all a problem. It was at all an issue uh, to which we should keep so much thought. He challenged many uh, social and cultural practices. He cautioned the validity, he cautioned the authenticity of many cultural and social practices that divided uh, society into two halves, giving privileges to one half and denying opportunity to another half. The people didn't know or didn't believe or didn't think that actually uh, they are enjoying facilities and uh, denying facilities to other group of people, but when Henry Gibson brought this issue to uh, the, before the people, people thought or found that really these things are serious issues. This is not the only play which was telling an untraditional, unconventional story to the people of the 19th century. All of his plays presented such stories that were telling stories that had never been told by anybody before Henry Gibson. When people read these stories, they found uh, shaken, they found shocked. For example, this play, uh, A Doll's House, shook the foundation of the male dominated society. When the people saw that a woman is revolting against her husband and going away, uh, going out of her home, never to come back, she would establish herself as a human being first. She would not be anybody's wife. She would not be anybody's daughter. She would not be uh, anybody's mother. She would not be anybody's sister. She wants to be a human being. In that time, it was completely unimaginable for a woman to behave in that way. But suddenly, Henry Gibson brings this issue to the notice of the people that a woman is feeling tortured, a woman is feeling humiliated and unable to tolerate the humiliation and injustice, torture inflicted on her by her husband. She is leaving her husband and going out not to come back again. Even she's leaving her children, saying that she would not be the mother of the children. First, she wants to be herself. She wants to establish her as a human being. So in 1879, it was really unimaginable, unthinkable, uh, uh, both for men and women that anybody can behave in that way. And that is why Henry Gibson was criticized by people very severely. Henry Gibson was criticized for every play he wrote, because in every play I'm saying that he was saying something untraditional and unconventional. He was saying something different from other things that usually typical writers were writing. 
this is also uh, such an exceptional play he in which he told such a very uh, traumatizing story the whole society felt traumatized whole society felt threatened felt uh, frightened when they saw this kind of story the conservative people and the guardians of the society came over heavily came heavily on um, Hendrik Ibsen criticizing him that he has tried to destabilize our social peace by writing this type of play. Because um, how are women tortured? How are women humiliated? How are women uh, maltreated in the society? They didn't think that women were tortured or women were badly treated. Women were humiliated in that society. The patriarchal society did not think at the time that they were behaving cruelly with women. Rather, they thought it is the duty of men. It is the duty of men to behave in that way with their wife. They would, they didn't see any sign of cruelty in their behavior. Okay, the male dominated society did not see any sign of cruelty in their behavior. They did not sign any they did not find a sign of humiliation, any, any, any sign of humiliation in the way they were behaving with their wife. And that they were thinking that they were behaving with their wife in the way men had been behaving with women for centuries. That is an accepted norm that in that way, a man has to behave with his way, with his wife. That is an accepted, uh, a settled issue uh, that this is how men have to behave with women. But Henry Gibson is telling us in this story that men are doing injustice, men are humiliating, men are torturing women psychologically every day. So how uh, was look how uh, Henry Kirchner was trying to shake the foundation of the male dominated society by this story. If we know the story in brief, then it will be very easy for us to uh, follow the uh, text. I want to tell you the story in brief, and then you know how Henry Kirchner was shaking the foundation of the male dominated society, how he was going to tell a different type of story uh, to the people of the 18th century. The story of this drama in brief, I am telling you, um, Nora and Helmer, they are the main characters of this drama. Helmer is the husband of Nora, and Nora is the wife of Helmer. They have been married for many years, and they have three children. They have been married for many years, and they have three children. Helmer is a government employee. He is a newly promoted bank manager. So as he's a bank manager, he belongs to the aristocratic um, society, aristocratic class. He is very much conscious of his prestige, of his honor, of his social position, of his status. He is not a, a common person. He thinks that as he's the bank manager, as a bank manager, he is a very um, high profile person, he thinks. One day, once he falls sick, Henry Gibson once falls sick, and his doctor recommends going to a wholesome place for weather chills. Henry Gibson, sorry, Helmer's doctor suggests that he go to a wholesome place for weather chains. Nora, not having enough money to take her husband to a wholesome place for the improvement of his health, borrows money without his consent from one person whose name was Krogestad. And Krogestad was a subordinate employee in the bank Helmer is the manager of. Helmer was a government employee. Okay. Uh, he was a government employee and he was, um, uh, he, was, he was an aristocratic person, but he didn't have as much money as he needs to have to go to uh, a wholesome place for weather chains. So his wife, not having enough money to take her husband to a wholesome place for the improvement of his health, borrowed money without telling her husband. And she borrowed money from one person whose name was Krogstad. 
and this Pakistan was a subordinate employee in the bank uh, her husband is the manager of. When he took the money, took the loan, she committed a kind of misgiving, a kind of unlawful activity. Nora had to force the signature of her date father as the surety. Okay. When Nora was borrowing money from that conquistad, Nora had to force the signature of her date father. Pakistan was an employee, a subordinate employee in the bank. Uh, Helmer was the manager of, and at the same time, he was a money lender. That was his business. So Nora went to Pakistan to borrow money. Pakistan would give, lend money to somebody, but for that, one has to be guarantor. That means a surety. Who would be the surety of uh, Nora's loan that she would take from Pakistan? Nora holds the signature of her dead father and showed Pakistan that my father would be the surety. If I fail to pay back the loan on my behalf, my father will pay back the loan. Look, Nora forced the signature of her dead father. Okay, this is a crime. This is an offense. But Nora did that because she did not have any other alternative but forcing the signature of her dead father because she didn't find anybody close to her who would help her to be her guarantor or to be the surety of her loan. That's why she had to force the signature of her dead father. However, Krogistad knew that Nora forced the signature of her dead father because Krogistad knew Helmer. And Krogistad also knew that Helmer's father-in-law, that means Nora's father, died long ago. And this signature is not the genuine signature, it is a forced signature. Although Krogistad knew it, he ignored it because he had the belief that Nora is the wife of a respectable person, her husband is a respectable person, her husband is the bank manager, and she would not fail to pay back the loan, she would pay the loan in installment because she is a gentle lady. It was just a formality and a, a legal obligation that somebody has to be the guarantor and that is why uh, he had to do that. So Nora forced the signature, Progester knew it, but he did not I take it seriously, rather ignored it. Then Helmer, look, Helmer cannot uh, tolerate Kogistad. Okay, the relationship between Helmer and Kogistad in the office is not very good. Helmer cannot, cannot tolerate Kogistad, does not like Kogistad because Kogistad behaves with Helmer very familiarly in the office. Helmer and Kogistad were friends in the school. Today, fortunately, Helmer has become the manager of this bank and Krogistad, unfortunately, is a petty employee here. So as a petty employee, as a subordinate, Krogistad should address Helmer as son, should show due respect to Helmer, but Krogistad thinks that Helmer is my friend. He was, he, he's my school friend, and that's why he behaves with Helmer very familiarly in the office, but Helmer feels very offended, humiliated, and insulted that a subordinate employee behaves with him very familiarly in the office before other staff. Helmer seems to be, um, look, he, he seems to be a different type of person. He should have accepted Krogestad at his friend, but although he is his friend, but in the office he thinks that this Krogestad, who is a, a subordinate officer, has to show due respect to the boss. But Krogestad behaves with him very family, familiarly. And that is why Helmut does not like Krogestad. And he always on the loop to find out a fault with Krogestad to dismiss him from the job. Helmut feels so offended unreasonably, okay, unnecessarily. He seems to be a man of a distorted mentality, Helmer here. Uh, that look, he does not like Krogistad. Why does he not like Krogistad? He does not like Krogistad only because Krogistad behaves with him familiarly in the office. Helmer thinks that Krogistad is a subordinate employee, so he will have to address me as sir. He will have to show due respect to me, but 
he does not do that. Rather, he calls me by my name in the office before other staff. And that's why Helman is always on the lookout to find out a fault with Kogistar to dismiss him from the job. And one day, Kogistar really finds a fault with Kogistar. Kogistar is a money lender, that is his faceless, and he has experiences of forging signatures of many people. And he is found guilty of having forged the signature of some people. And for that, Helmer decides to fire Krogestad. Now Krogestad comes to Nora and tries to blackmail her by saying that Nora has to request her husband not to dismiss him. Nora is in a problem. Nora knows the nature of her husband. Nora knows that her husband will not tolerate it if she goes to request him to dismiss Kogestad. But Kogestad tells Nora that if she does not request her husband not to dismiss him, then he will reveal to her husband that Nora forced the signature of her father and borrowed loan from him. Nora is in a serious problem. She knows that if her husband knows anyway that as she borrowed money from Kogestad, forging the signature of her dead father, and without telling her husband, then her heaven, her home, her all peace in her home will be next to the door of the hell. Okay, so she was in a serious tension how she would manage it. And finally she agreed with Krogestad that she would request her husband. Okay. Please turn off your microphone. Somebody is sitting with your microphone on. I request all of you to turn off your microphone, please. It is creating a bad kind of sound. However, so look, um, uh, what I was what I was talking about. Look, Nora did not tell her husband when she borrowed money from Kogestad because Helmar had a philosophy. Helmar didn't like to borrow money from anybody, didn't like to lend money to anybody. He had the philosophy, no borrowing, no lending. He thought, believed that a house ceases to be happy when it is founded on borrowing. That was Helmar's philosophy. So Helmar would rather die than borrow money from anybody. Okay. Helmar would rather die than borrow money from anybody. Nora knew that her husband would die, but her husband would not agree to borrow money from anybody because he has an ideology. He has a belief. He believes strongly and he likes to cling to his belief that he would not borrow money from anybody. His simple philosophy is that no borrowing, no lending. He will not borrow money from anybody, nor will he lend money to anybody. He believes that the peace in a home ceases to be when the house is founded on borrowing. And that is why he would not agree to borrow money from anybody. If Herbert does not borrow money from anybody, then he will have to die. The doctor has suggested that he be taken to a wholesome place for the improvement of his health. So Nora didn't find any alternative but borrowing money from that person without telling her husband because she likes to save the life of her husband. And that is why she borrowed money from Kogestad. Nora has committed three crimes to the eyes of Helmut by borrowing money from Kogestad. What are the three crimes? One is that she took the money without telling her husband. A wife cannot do anything without telling her husband. A wife does not have any freedom a wife does not have any permission or she cannot do anything without the consent of her husband. That is what our patriarchal society thinks. That is what our male-dominated society believes. A woman does not have any power. A woman does not have any freedom to do anything in her own way without sharing it with her husband. So Nora has committed a serious crime to the eyes of Helmut 
that she borrowed money from Kurdistan without telling her him. Nora has committed another crime, that is, she forced the signature of her dead father. That is, that is, that is unlawful. And that's a criminal case for which she would be sentenced to imprisonment if Pakistan goes to a court and files a case against Nora, then Nora would be tried and she would be guilty of committing a criminal case because she forced the signature of her dead father. So Nora has committed a serious fault by taking loan from Pakistan, by not telling her husband and by forging the signature of her dead father. There is another crime that Nora has committed, that is she borrowed money from one whom her husband did not like. So Nora, Nora knows that her husband will not forgive her. Nora knows that her husband will not tolerate it. And if her husband knows that she has borrowed money from Pakistan by forging the signature of her dead father and not telling him, then her abode of peace, her house, her heaven will be completely a hell. So she agrees with Pakistan that she would try to convince her husband not to dismiss him. When Helmer comes home, Nora tells Helmer, request Helmer not to dismiss Pakistan. And Helmer gets angry. Who are you to poke your nose in my official matter? You are a woman. Your duty is to doing household chores. Your duty is to take care of the family. Your duty is to take care of the inside matters of the family. You cannot poke your nose in an official, official matter. That is my official matter. So why are you coming to talk on favor of Pakistan? Who is Pakistan? What is your relationship with him that you are requesting me not to dismiss him? Whether I will dismiss Pakistan or not is my personal decision. It is my matter. It is none of your business. Why are you coming to plead his case? What is your relationship? What is the matter between you and Pakistan? Helmer, this is how misbehaves with his wife, Nora. Nora still tries to convince her husband not to dismiss Pakistan. And Helmer gets terribly angry, gets angry beyond limit that his wife is crossing the limit. He is sailing against the wind. He is sailing against the wind. She is sailing against the wind. She is crossing the limit. She is crossing all limits of a woman, of, 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 of women. She should not come to poke her nose as a woman in the official matter of a man. So she is crossing the limit of a wife. Helmer gets so angry that he decides that he would dismiss Pakistan next day. Okay. He would not have dismissed Pakistan next day if he had not been requested by his wife, Nora, in that way. So getting angry with his wife, Helmer says that I will dismiss Pakistan next day. And finally, Nora fails to convince her husband to, to save the job of Pakistan. When Pakistan knows that Nora has not been able to convince her husband to uh, convince her husband, okay, she he writes a letter. Pakistan writes a letter revealing everything and drops the letter in the later box of Helmer's home. His intention was to terrify Helmer and Nora, that if Helmer fires him now, then he would go to a court and file a case against his wife, and it would be a criminal case for which his wife will have to be punished. And when he will see that his wife will be in problem, he might stop dispensing me. That was his intention. He wrote the letter, revealing everything, and dropped the letter in the drop later box of Helmer's family in the morning when Helmer comes to open the lock of the later box. Okay, however, you, you will 
say it in detail, help her hands the letter box and gets a letter. I will tear up the envelope of the letter, reads the letter and knows everything. And Nora's house, Nora's abode of uh, happiness, Nora's happen falls down, collapses. Helmer gets fiery, he gets terribly angry, he goes beyond limit that his wife borrowed loan from Pakistan without telling him. He, she borrowed loan from Pakistan, forging the signature of her dead father. How dear a wife can do that? How dear a wife do that? How can a wife borrow money without consulting with her husband? Who has given this right and freedom to my wife that she would do that? And she collapses, she, she blames his wife for everything that she is not at all. Even he blames his wife, comparing his wife to her father, that your father was also of the nature that you have today. You have inherited this nature from your father. Helmer tells his wife that from today, you will not come to my children because my children will inherit this bad character that you have. You are disobedient, you are disloyal, you have gone against the limit. You have crossed the limit. You have cheated uh, your husband's belief, your husband's philosophy. You have cheated with your husband. So you are a bad lady. And Nora is blamed, uh, uh, chastised in a language that Nora cannot tolerate. See, is this the man with whom I have been living for 18 years? Did I borrow the money to save the life of my father? Did I borrow the money to save the life of my brother? Did I borrow the money for my own personal comfort? Did I borrow the money to buy my jewelry? He, she's now thinking, I borrowed the money to save the life of my husband. If I had not borrowed the money, then my husband would have died. But for borrowing money to save the life of my husband, that husband is blaming me for all these things that I'm not responsible at all. Even what? Even, even he says that I should not go to my children. He says that if I go to my children, my children would inherit my bad character. Am I a woman of bad character? What have I done for which my husband is blaming me in that way? So she realizes that she is, this home is not mine. She realizes that this is his home. This is not my home. She realizes that she's nothing but a puppet in the hands of her husband. She's nothing but a doll in the hands of her husband. It is a doll's house. And with this realization, she leaves her husband, goes out of his home, never to come back. And this ending of the drama terrifies us frightens us, shakes the foundation of the male-dominated society that a woman is going out of the home of her husband. The doors are banging. Okay, when Nora goes out, and Nora is going out never to come back to her husband. How terribly angry she has become that she would never come back to her husband's home. Many critics are saying that if not for her husband, she should have come back for her children because she who is also a mother apart from being a wife. She may hate her husband for that, but she should not hate or dislike, or she should not leave her children in distress for the fault of her husband or for her angry anger with her husband. But Nora says that Henry Gibson has ended the play in this way that Nora would not be anybody's wife would not be anybody's daughter, would not be anybody's sister, would not be anybody's mother. She would be a person. She would be a human being. She, she wants to establish herself as a human being. This is how the drama ends. And this is something the world sees for the first time. Before Henry Gibson, nobody dared to speak of women in that way. Before Henry Gibson, in no country, nobody, uh, nobody uh, showed women going against the male dominated society in that way in which Nora is going in Norway. So 
the male dominated society of that society felt shaken they, 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 they felt that the henry gibson is actually is trying to destabilize our social peace women's position is a settled issue helmer is behaving rightly okay it didn't it didn't appear to the male dominated society of the time that helmer was guilty at all for his favor with his wife but then everybody thought that helmer has done the right thing and what helmer, helmer is saying is absolutely right it appeared to the men that we will have to be under the complete control of women we will have to be under the complete control of their husbands of their of their guardians they should not be free to do what they like to do sorry just i want to take two minutes break for the other So I have taken the bag, Baba. Azan. Labib. I'm not finished. Sorry, I want to take a short break for the other okay keep waiting just hold on a loud sound is coming here okay it's over so this is the story of this drama in short this story of Henry Gibson dramatizes in this drama it is the story of a woman how she revolted against her husband and why she revolted against her husband. I've said that is, this, is true, this drama was written in 1879. Look at the time. In this time, women were not actually behaving in the way Nora was doing. The society felt that it is a settled issue. Women's position in our society is a settled issue. It is not at all a problem. And it is not an issue of discussion. It is not an issue to which we have to give so much thought. So people, especially the conservative people, criticized Henry Gibson severely for this drama, that he is saying something that will destabilize our society. Male-dominated society has always thought that uh, keeping their wives under their control, rebuking their wife, even sometimes beating their wife uh, is a part of their duty of uh, uh, is a part of their duty. Okay, They didn't think that it is a kind of crime or it is a kind of offense. It's a kind of sin. Rather they thought that as a man he deserves these things. And this is how they have believed with the 
women. Henry Gibson is criticizing this attitude of the male dominated society that this is a kind of injustice, this is a kind of torture, it's a kind of humiliation that we do on women every day by behaving with them in this way. Men should not behave with women in this way. And that is why you will see, I will read the play and the story from the text and you will know how Helmar is behaving with his wife. In the beginning, we see that Helmar and um, Helmar's wife, Nora, are very much traditional uh, men and women of our society. Nora, in the beginning of this drama, is a tradition. Uh, why do, are you writing your name and ID? Kamrul Islam, are you new to this class? This is the fourth or fifth class I am giving you. And every day I tell you not to write your whole uh, name in this way. Don't do this. You do not need to write your name. I get your name role while you are entering here. Okay. So I'm reading from the text. At the very beginning of the text, it's a three act play. I'm reading from the first act. At the very beginning, you will find stage directions. Many lines are written, uh, giving a description how to arrange the um, stays, how to decorate the stays. Modern plays have these stage directions, but uh, plays that were written in the religious period, in the Elizabethan period or in the 18th century do not have these stage directions. Perhaps you are now reading Shakespeare's play, you would see there, um, you, you don't have any stage directions. That means the author has not given any direction about how to decorate the stays. Directly, you are getting the story in this drama. In the past, we were getting the story only from the dialogues of the characters. Okay. Kamrul Islam, why are you writing your ID name? And you are one after another sending SMS. Why is that Kamrul Islam? Can you talk to me, Kamrul Islam? Kamrul Islam, what is your problem? Why are you trying to draw my attention? Kamrul Islam, can you hear me? Kamrul Islam, you are here. I see, I, I can see you. Why are you writing your name and ID? I'm telling you again and again not to write your name ID in this way. I get your name. I do not need to know your name in this way on the screen. Please don't do that. It distracts my attention. Okay. So what I was telling you that in modern plays, we get the story not only from the dialogues of the characters, but also from different images. Even from the stage directions, we also get the story of the play. But in the plays of the Elizabethan period or of the 17th century, 18th century, we get the story mainly from the dialogues of the characters. You will not see any stage directions. It was not there because in the Elizabethan period, plays were mostly staged in the open place, either under the under under a banyan tree or on a makeshift stage. So there was not much scope for the director to decorate the stage there. That's why all the story of the drama we are getting from the dialogues uttered by different characters. But modern plays are different from the Elizabethan plays or from the plays of other uh, periods in this particular uh, uh, aspect that in modern plays we get the story not only from the dialogues of the characters but also for, from the directions and from different images. If on the stage there is uh, there is a needle, okay, if there is a needle on the stage and if it is visible to the audience, you have to understand that this needle is also telling you a significant story. This needle is also a kind of character that is putting a significant contribution to the development of the story. If you find a chair on the stage, the chair is just turned with its back towards the audience. Okay, it is kept with its back towards the audience. Look, usually a chair is not kept in that way. A chair will be with its back towards the world, but a chair is placed on the body, on the stage with its back towards the audience. If you find a chair on the stage in that way, 
you have to understand that it has a significant meaning. And that is why it has been there. And when you were watching the play, gradually you would understand why the chair is there uh, with its back towards the audience. If there is a net hanging against the wall, it is also a kind of character telling you significant thing about the story. It is also contributing to the development of the story. This is how modern plays tell us stories. So we are getting stories in the modern plays, not only from the dialogues uttered by characters, but also from different images, even from the stage directions. Okay. In this play, there is a long description of how the stage will be set in the very beginning of the play. There will be a home wall, then inside the home, there will be a table there, there will be a bookshelf there, there will be the dining table there, there will be a clock there, there will be this there, that there. This is how the stage will have to be decorated. So this dining table, this bookshelf, that wall, that table clock, or these things are telling uh, significantly, giving us ideas significantly uh, the, about the story that we are going to see. So these things are also uh, play the role of character sometimes. Here you will see a room comfortably and tastefully, but an expensively furnished. A room is furnished not expensively, but comfortably and tastefully. Helmer is a government employee. He does not have much money to decorate his home expensively. Okay, he is a middle class person doing a government job. He is the manager of a bank. He does not have hey, money as much as the richest people have. So he cannot decorate his room very expensively. But with the little things that he has, he has decorated his home very tastefully and very comfortably. In the back on the right, a door leads to the wall. On the left, another door leads to Helmer's study. And there is another path that leads to the Helmer's study room. You can see the study room of Helmer. So when you are shown the study room of a person, you have to understand that here, an educated person lives. Helmer is not simply a man, but he is a man with taste because we find a study room of him, Helmer. Helmer is different from other bankers. While other bankers are busy uh, with the other things, after coming home from the office, perhaps they're uh, doing other things. They are not going to read any book, but Helmer is different from other bankers. He has a study room. He goes to his study room and reads there. So this study room is also telling um, are significant things about the character of Helmer. Helmer is not a common person. He has taste. He has a developed personality. He reads books. Just to tell us or give us this idea of the character of Helmer, this study room is there. Between the two doors, a piano fold. And you will also find the piano between the two rooms. And in whose home will you find the piano? So you can easily understand the status of this family, the taste of this family. There is a piano there. And in the middle of the left uh, wall, a door and near the front of window, near the window, a round table with armchairs and a small sofa in the right wall, somewhat to the back of the door against the same wall. Just you would read this description of the arrangement of the stage, okay? Setting, description of the setting of the stage, you will get an idea of the status of the social class, of the cultural upbringing of Helmer. Okay, so you have to read this thing. These are also significant lines. Although the story is not there, but there are some things that are significant to understand the story of this play. Nora comes. So I'm coming to the dialogue. It is beginning with Nora. Nora, hide the Christmas tree carefully. Then the children must on no account see it before this evening when it is lighted up. Nora went out to buy Christmas tree. The drama is beginning at the Christmas. The drama is beginning at the Christmas. Look, this is a very happy day on which this drama is beginning. And look, Nora went out. Nora went out to buy Christmas tree and other things that she needs to have 
to celebrate the Christmas befittingly. And Nora does not want her children to see the Christmas tree and other things now. They will see when, when, when it will be lighted up. What do you understand from here in this line? Nora went out to buy things. In 19, sorry, 1879, when this play was written, a woman went out. A woman went out to buy Christmas tree and other things that she needs to celebrate the Christmas. So Helmer is not a conservative person, unlike other persons. Helmer is an educated man and believes to some extent to the freedom in the freedom of women. He has given his wife freedom to go out. His wife went out to buy things. Look, she went out not being escorted by her husband or by any male member of the family, but that she went out alone, with, accompanied by her maid sergeant. So Helmer is a traditionally good person. Here we find this impression. And to the porter taking out her purse, how much? Porter, 50 old. Then he gives 50 old to the porter. There is a crown, no keep changing. The porter hangs her and goes. Nora shuts the door. She continues smiling. She continues smiling in quiet glee as she takes off her outdoor things. Nora continues smiling. Nora is a very jovial mood, in a very happy mood in the beginning of the play. Look at the mood of Nora. Nora is in a gleeful mood. Nora is in a jovial mood, in a very happy mood. And Nora's mood matches with the mood of the day. It is the Christmas on which the story is beginning. And Nora is in a very jovial mood. So the drama is beginning in a very gleeful way, in a very um, happy mood. But the drama ends in a tragic way. The beginning and the ending of the drama are like apples and oranges. Okay, there is a good difference, uh, uh, astonishing difference between the beginning of the drama and the ending of the drama. The drama begins in a very happy mood. Nora continues smiling in quiet glee as she takes off her outdoor things, taking from her packet a bag of macarons. She eats one or two, then she goes on tiptoe to her husband's door and listens. Nora then takes the bag of macaron. Nora seems to be very much childish, very much girlish, that she still has the habit of eating macarons. She seems to have a sweet tooth. She seems to have a sweet tooth. She has the habit of eating macarons. Usually babies eat macarons, but Nora went out and she bought macarons and she is eating macarons. Then she whips her mouth and goes close to the room where her husband is sitting or is standing perhaps. He goes to husband's door and listens and she listens what her husband is doing. Nora, yes, he's at home. Nora is talking to herself. Yes, my husband is at home. She begins harming again crossing to the table on the right and Nora is humming. Nora is feeling so happy. The drama is beginning very uh, happily, in a very happy mood. The drama is beginning, Nora is humming. When does one hum? When one feels very happy. When one is in a very jovial mood, Nora is humming. Helmer in his room, is that my luck twittering there? Look at this sentence, is that my luck twittering there? Is that my lark? What is the meaning of lark? What is the meaning of lark? Lark is a bird. And Helmer from inside the room is saying, is that my lark twittering? Helmer laughs his wife very much. In the beginning, you will see Helmer laughs his wife very much. But there is no love in this love. That is what Henry Gibson is showing. Okay. We also love our wives. You love your wife. But there is not actually any love in this love. It is nothing but an hypocrisy that we have to our women, to our wives. That is what Henry Gibson is showing in this play. Henry Gibson loves, sorry, Helmer loves his wife very much. He loves his wife so much that he compares his wife to a lot. Is that my lot twittering here? 
আমার গানের পাখি এখানে গান করে বেড়াচ্ছে নাকি এরকম করে সে তার স্ত্রীকে সম্বোধন করছে হাউ মাস হি লাভস হিজ ওয়াইফ দ্যাট হি কলস হিজ ওয়াইফ এ টু লার্ক ইজ দ্যাট মাই লার্ক টুইটারিং হিয়ার নোরা অ্যাকসেপ্টস রেসপন্ডস নোরা বিজি ওপেনিং সাম অফ দি পার্সেলস ইয়েস ইট ইজ ইয়েস আই অ্যাম ইওর লার্ক আই অ্যাম ইওর লার্ক টুইটারিং হিয়ার হেলমান ইজ দা ইজ ইট দা স্কুরিয়াল ফিস্কিং অ্যারাউন্ড is it my squirrel frisking about what is the meaning of squirrel cart birali helmar tar istri ke cart birali pole sambodhon korte is my squirrel frisking about helmar laughs his wife so much that he calls his wife squirrel is it the way of expressing laugh that you would call your wife squirrel helmar calls his wife squirrel is it my squirrel frisking about Someone will say that Hemla loves his wife and that is why he addresses his wife in that way, calls his wife a squirrel, calls his wife a lark, calls his wife a songbird. Hemla is addressing his wife in this way and showing his love towards his wife. Okay. I do want to talk about this, sir. Tell me. Tell me. Sir, uh, I want to look back in anger, sir. एलिजन এলিজেন কেও বিভিন্ন সময় কিন্তু তার হাজবেন্ড হচ্ছে মানে অ্যাকুইজিশন দিতে থাকে তার ফ্যামিলি নিয়ে তার ফ্যামিলি নিয়ে কথা বলতে থাকে মানে এরকম প্রবলেম আমরা দেখতে পারি স্যার এই জন্য স্যার বললাম আর কি ভেরি মাচ লাইক দ্যাট ইট ইজ ভেরি মাচ লাইক থিংস দ্যাট উই এভরি ডে ডু হিয়ার উই লাভ आवर ওয়াইফ ইট ইজ ইট ইজ ট্রু দ্যাট উই লাভ आवर ওয়াইফ বাট ট্রুলি লাভ ইজ নট ইন দিস লাভ দ্যাট উই শো টু অল আমাদের দেশে কিছু গান আছে বুঝছো আমাদের একটা গান আছে অনেক সাধের ময়না আমার বাঁধন ছেড়ে যাই উড়ে ব্যক্তি এরকম আছে না আমরা আর কোনো উপমা পাইনি উদিনেন ফাইন্ড এনি সিমিলি অর মেটাফর টু এক্সপ্রেস आवर লাভ টু आवर গার্লফ্রেন্ড উই ডোন্ট ফাইন্ড আদার ইমেজেস অর আদার সিমিলিস টু এক্সপ্রেস आवर লাভ টু आवर ওয়াইফ উই ইউজ দিস টাইপস অফ মেটাফর সিমিলিস ইমেজেস to express our love actually we do not consider women to be human beings and that is why we go to find such images find some similes and metaphors helmar helmar is comparing his wife calling his wife sometimes a squirrel sometimes it's a, a song bird look at the next sentence and helmar sorry acha eta kara korche era ki pagol na ki era ei je eker por ek message diye jacche kon dui dash আমি তো বাবা মেসেজটা দিতে নিষেধ করছি তোমরা কি ইংরেজি একাত্ম বোঝো তো জন্য কি আই ডোন্ট আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড হোয়েদার ইউ আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড অর নট ডোন্ট ইউ আন্ডারস্ট্যান্ড মাই ডিরেকশনস আই এম রিকোয়েস্টিং অল অফ ইউ নট টু রাইট ইওর নেম আইডি ইন দিস ওয়ে প্লিজ ডোন্ট ডু দ্যাট হোয়েন ইট গেটস ভিজিবল অন দ্য স্ক্রিন ইট ডিস্ট্রাক্টস মাই অ্যাটেনশন আই এম গোইং টু রিড হোয়াট ইউ হ্যাভ রিটেন देयर হোয়াট ইজ দ্য নেসেসিটি টু রাইট ইওর নেম হিয়ার প্লিজ ডোন্ট ডু দ্যাট ডোন্ট রাইট ইওর নেম I get your name while you are entering here. You do not need to. Your name is like a, like a Afra Murtaza, Kamrul Islam, Moinuddin, eh? Sadiq. You have written your name. So I am getting your name. You do not need to write your name again in the chat box. I don't have the time to go to check the chat box. Please don't do that. And Nora accepts. Nora responds. Nora does not mind when she is called this lad. Nor does not mind when she is called a squirrel, because this is how men express their love. Nora has learned that this is how men express their love to their wife, and this is how women accept the love of their husband. To every husband, his wife is very much like a lark, very much like a squirrel. This is how men and women behave in the society. How do we learn that we are men and you are women? how do you learn that these are the duties of women how do you learn that as a woman you have to do these things you are reading many books but you will not find any any specific book in which you 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 have 
learn these duties that women do. Okay, you are learning all these things from your surrounding. When you are learning all these things through your observation, you are learning from almost everything that you are a woman, and as a woman, you have to behave in this particular way. Even if you are looking inside your home, you will see that your father has bought you a doll that is also telling you that when you will grow up, you have to behave like that. You find the similarity between you and the doll that your father gifted you on your birthday. What is the doll doing there? Today's dolls are advanced, but only 20 years back, if you go to see a doll that a girl was playing with, you will see the image of the doll. What is the doll doing? The doll is in the role of a woman, taking care of many babies, taking care of her husband, taking care of cows, cooking rice, washing dishes, sweeping the room, washing um, clothes. This is the image that you find of the dolls that girls are presented on their birthday. If you go back 50 years, you will see that women had dolls. Dolls representing the images of women. What were the images of women? A woman was sitting in the planking. What is the planking? It's kind of palky. There, a woman is sitting, drawing a long veil covering her face. So when a girl found similarity between her and that doll that she had put in the showcase, she understood that she would have to be like that. So she was learning her behavior, her responsibility, her duties, even from the doll that she is presented on her birthday. To me, I don't want to you to me cinema actually, you are watching movies. In the movies, you see what women do there. What women do there, you will see women are doing, 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 doing these things. So from these things, you will every day learn how you have to behave. Nora behaves very traditionally because she has learned from the society that husbands behave with their wives in that particular way. Husbands lovingly call their wives sometimes a lark, sometimes a squirrel, sometimes a songbird. But Henry Kibzen has shown finally that there is no love in these sweet terms that the men use to address their wives or to show their love to their husbands. When Henry Gibson was writing this play, when he wrote this play, women were born to be only somebody's wives. Women were born to produce children. Women were born to take care of their husbands. Women didn't have any other things to do. It didn't occur in the imagination of women at the time that they would work for the development of the economy of a nation. They did not think that they would work for the upbringing or they would work for the welfare of a community of people. They didn't work that they would go to office. They didn't imagine that they would go to the battlefield to fight. They didn't imagine that they would be pilots one day flying in the sky. When Henry Kitchen wrote this play, the women thought that becoming somebody's wife, becoming somebody's mother, taking care of husband, serving the husband, were the only duties, responsibilities of women. They grew up with this belief that someday when they will grow up, they will have to be somebody's wife, somebody's mother, somebody's daughter, they will have to cook food, they will have to wash the clothes of the male members of the family, they will have to take care of the cows or other cattle in the home. That was what women were doing in the past and these were their duties. You will read one famous novel written by Maxim Gorky. Maxim Gorky the name of the novel is Mother, okay. In Mother, um, Pavel's mother is every day beaten by Pavel's father, okay. Pavel's father works in a company, he goes to the factory in the morning and in the evening he comes back drinking very heavily. He is, he's a drunken man after coming home. The first thing that he does significantly is beating his wife. He beats his wife. Every day he will do that because he thinks that beating his wife is a part of his responsibility. And Pavel's mother also thinks that being beaten by her husband is also a part of her duty. Every day she will have to be beaten by her husband. 
if one day she's not beaten by her husband, she thinks that her husband is perhaps not in a good mood today. And that is why he has not beaten her. And her, her wife does not have any, does not have any objection that she is beaten by her husband. She's never angry with her husband. She is beaten in the evening, but at night she just sits to serve her husband. Because the society has told her that she is a woman and this is her faith, she will have to accept it. So this is how women grew up in our society. And it's still growing up. Even today, you will see many women who are growing up with the belief that they would not get the things that men are enjoying in our society. There are many women even today in our society who believe that there are differences between men and women. There are many women who believe that uh, after, uh, after marriage, they would have to be under the complete control of their husbands. They, they, are, they, are, they, they have learned it and they are behaving in that way. Nora, in the beginning, is that kind of girl who learned traditionally that she was a woman and women's duties are like this. Helmer, why did the squirrel get home? So when did the squirrel get home? Amar Kadbirali Kokon Bari Fini Ashlo, Bangla to the translate for Erukum Kurupade. Nora, just this time. And Nora is, is responding. Nora does not mind when she's called a squirrel because she has seen her mother was also called a squirrel by her father, perhaps. Nora saw that her other sisters are also called the squirrels by their husband, perhaps. And that is why she does not mind when she's called a squirrel by her husband. Nora, just this time, hides the bag of macaron in her packet and whips her mouth. When Nora is going to her husband, Nora whips her mouth, okay, and hides the bag of macarons. Look, Nora eats macarons. Nora has this bad habit of macarons. However, Nora whips her mouth and then goes to her husband because if her husband says that she ate macarons, her husband would rebuke her. So in fear of being rebuked by her husband, Nora is whipping her mouth. So Nora does not have the freedom of eating. What she will eat and what she will not eat will be decided by her husband. Whether Nora will eat this type of food or that item of food is depending on the wish and the liking of her husband. Henry Gibson has, has tried to say in this play that after marriage, a woman loses all types of freedom. Okay, after marriage, a woman loses all types of freedom. Before marriage, a girl may have some freedom of doing some things in her own way. But after marriage, a girl loses all types of freedom. She loses the freedom of speech. She loses the freedom of movement. She loses the freedom of thought. She loses the freedom of imagination. She even loses the freedom of dream. She cannot dream in the way she likes to. She cannot imagine in the way she likes to. She cannot think in the way she likes to. She cannot go out now without being escorted by a male member from her in-laws home. She cannot speak in the way she likes. She, she would have to think now in the way her husband likes. She would have to now imagine in the way her husband likes. Her husband's belief, her husband's thought, her husband's ideas will be her beliefs, her ideas, her imaginations. She will have to think in the way her husband likes. So this is how a woman after marriage loses her freedom. This is true. This is not uh, completely wrong. This is, I think, absolutely true. Very few women have the freedom of thinking and have the freedom of imagining, have the freedom of dreaming after marriage in their own way. Because if your dream does not match with the dream of your husband, then there will be a conflict between you. So you have to think, you have to imagine, you have to, you have to believe okay, in the way your husband likes. And it will feel that you are not actually living your life. You are living the life of your husband. You are, you are a woman. Henry Gibson has said in the big interaction of this play you read that there are two 
spaces. We are two different spaces. Women are women and men are men. So we are different. Our, but the society has only one standard to measure the things of both men and women. We are women. We have a different type of taste. We have different type of personality. What we like may not be liked by men. What we uh, feel may not be felt by men, but the male dominated society does not want to believe in that. The male dominated society has developed one standard by using which they go to measure the behavior of both the men and the women. And it is here the women fall victims because what is a serious problem to a woman may not be a serious problem to a man. What is very significant to a woman may be very insignificant to a man. Narir kache je jinishti khubi gurutopurno sheti purusher kache khubi tuchcho hote pare. O mone korte ei shamanno ekti bishoy othoch it is a serious thing to you. When you have taken it seriously you may be disliked by the male dominated society. The male dominated society comes to measure it with this particular standard that it has developed over centuries. And that's why women's problems are never problems to men. Narider samasya kokhono purusher kache samasya bole mone hoy na. Karon oi je purusher standard purush hoyto eto boro ekta jam dite pare kintu ekta narir ek foot jam dite hoy to tar koshto hobe. So I to say that I'm giving you this example for lack of a proper term that what is a serious thing to a woman may not be a serious thing to a man but men is judging everything by using the same standard and that is a problem and that is creating all these uh, bad situations between men and women in our society so nora does not have the freedom of eating macaron because her husband does not like her husband does not want her to eat macaroons why her husband does not want her to eat macaroons because her husband thinks macaroons spoil the teeth of a person just as a mother or a father is very much careful about the teeth of their babies a mother does not want her baby to eat too much chocolate or too much ice cream because she has the belief even the father does not want his daughter or son to eat too many chocolates because he thinks that if his baby eats too many chocolates then the chocolates will spoil his teeth helmar does not want his wife to eat macaroons because he thinks that if his wife eats too many macaroons the macaroons will spoil the teeth of nora as if nora does not have any common sense to understand what she should do and what she should not do Nora is considered by Helmut to be very much like a baby. Helmut does not think that Nora has intelligence to understand what she should do and what she should not do. Nora, Helmut always thinks that it is his duty to guide his wife properly. He always thinks that he will have to decide everything of his wife. He always thinks that his wife will not be able to decide properly eh, things. So this is how Helmut estimates his wife's intelligence. And I think there are many husbands in the society who think of their wives in that way. You'll still find many husbands who think that other is the is three kono bichwa bolte hain lekin tu bhi bus bana, tu bhi acha bus bana. At the group of people, bichay alochan na hote, jokhon is three acha bolte aashe je, and tu ra kya alochan karso, you will see that the husband is saying that you will not understand it. Why does the husband say that? The husband thinks that. The, the woman is not intelligent enough to understand such serious things. Women are always considered to be less intelligent than men. Male-dominated society has believed that, and that is why the husband decides which food the wife will eat and which food she will not eat. Istri daat nashto hoy jabe ite niye istri yato ta chinta nai, yato ta chinta shamil. Shami istri ke kato bhalo vashe. He has decided, he has decided which food his wife will eat and which food she will not eat. This is the freedom that Nora has. 
Nora even does not have this little freedom of eating a macaroon after marriage because her husband will take it seriously. Her husband will get an, I think, and it is really, if her husband sees that Nora has eaten macaroon, then he will perhaps beat her, saying that you are spoiling your teeth. You don't have common sense. Nora is whipping her mouth before going to her husband. Look, uh, Nora says, come here, Torvald, and see what I have been buying. Nora went out to buy many things. She has bought many things and is inviting her husband to come to see what she has bought from outside. Helmer says, don't interrupt me. A little later, he opens the door and looks in, open a pen in his hand. A little later, his, uh, her husband comes, looks in, looks in. He has not yet come to Nora, rather he looks in and he has a pen in his hand, buying. Did you say? Buying. Did you say? What? All that has any little, has my, sorry, has my little spendthrift been making the money fly again? Is my spendthrift making the money fly again? Helmer thinks that his wife cannot preserve money. Whenever she has money in her hand, she makes it fly. Okay. And he's calling his wife a spend trip. Is my spend trip, little spend trip. Okay, little. This word little is very important. Helmer always thinks his wife to be little. He does not think that his wife has grown up. His wife is very much like his daughter to him. He likes to keep his wife under his control, under his guardianship, under his happiness. Is my little spend trip making the money fly? No, no. Why, Torval? Surely we can afford to we can afford to launch out a little more. My dear husband, you have been promoted to the post of manager, and now we can afford to spend a little more. It's the first Christmas we haven't had since then. Helmer, come, come. Do you know the meaning of come, come? Come, come. This phrase is an expression of annoyance. When somebody is angry and is expressing his animals, uses the phrase, come, 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 come. You'll find it in Hamlet. Come, come, you, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you caution me with an idle tongue, with a wicked tongue. Hamlet is talking to his mother in, the, in, her, in his mother's closet, okay? His mother has called him, Hamlet has gone to his mother and he's talking to his mother in his mother's chamber. His mother is saying, come, come, you answer with idle tongue. Hamlet says, go, go, you are cautioning with wicked tongue. So come, come is a phrase of expressing animals. Helmer seems to be very angry when uh, Nora is saying that we can spend a little more now because you have been promoted to the post of the bank manager. Nora does not seem to be very intelligent to Helmer, and that's why he thinks she is saying that, come, come, we can't afford to squander money. We cannot, we cannot squander money. We cannot afford to spend money in that way. Nora, oh yes, Torvald, do let us squander a little now, just the least little bit. You know, you will soon be earning heaps of money. No, my dear husband, let me spend a little more money because you know that very soon you are going to earn heaps of money. Helmer, yes, from the New Year's Day. That is from the New Year's Day. I will get salary on the new scale from the New Year's Day, not now. There is a whole quarter before my, before my first salary is due. And a whole quarter month we have to pass with this little salary that we gave every month, Nora, never mind. We can borrow the. We can borrow in the meantime. We can borrow in the meantime. We can borrow. If we are in lack of money, then we can borrow in the meantime. Helmer, Nora, look at the word. There is a sign of exclamation here. Nora, Helmer seems to be terribly angry when Nora has said that they can borrow in the meantime. Nora. He goes up to her and takes her playfully by the hand. 
Helman now goes up to Nora and takes her playfully by her ear. Helmer, Helmer takes her playfully by playfully, okay, playfully, he takes her by the ear. Helmer goes and kisses her by the ear. Can we imagine? Helmer is kissing the ear of Nora. How angry Helmer has become that he is going to cast the ear of Nora. When does we do that? When our baby is doing something that we don't expect, that we don't like, we go and cast the ear of the, we twist the ear of the baby just to give him or her a lesson. Helmer has come here and is twisting the ear of his wife playfully. Okay, it is playfully, but it is very disgraceful. It is very insulting that he is twisting the yard of his wife. His wife is not a little baby. She is a grown up woman having three children. And Helmer has come to twist her, twist her ear. This mass Helmer loves his wife. He calls his wife my lark. He calls his wife my little squirrel. He calls his wife my songbird, my loving bird. He pretends as if he will not live without his wife. But look how much he loves his wife. Actually, he is twisting the yard of his wife when his wife has said something that goes against his philosophy. Helmer does not like to borrow money from anybody. That is what he has told his wife, that he will never borrow money from anybody. But today, his wife is telling him that if necessary, they would borrow in the meantime. So this lady has not learned anything from me. She seems to be a very disobedient person. Herman has got angry and is twisting the ear of his wife. Twisting the ear of somebody is very disgraceful, very insulting, very humiliating. You can tolerate being beaten, but you cannot tolerate when somebody twists your ear. So look how much Herman loves his wife. And then look what he does. It's still my little feather vein. It's still my little feather vein. Who is a feather vein? A feather vein is a person who does not have any common sense. Who is a fool? A feather vein is somebody who is foolish, who does not have anything in its head or in her head. Still my feather vein. This is what Helmer considers his wife. Helmer considers his wife is a feather vein. He considers his wife to be next to a match. He does not think that his wife has any common sense, any intelligence that one needs to have to understand what one should do and what one should not do. This is how husbands think that they would have to guide their wives. They would have to keep their wives under their control. Otherwise, wives would make wrong decisions. It is at least thought at that time when uh, Henry Gibson was writing this play. Even still now many people think so. Even still now many people think so. Women do not understand as much as men understand. It is thought by many men still now. So my little, my look at the combination of love and ignorance. My, my little, feather brain. My, my little feather brain. Look at the combination of love and ignorance. Love and, sorry, negligence. Okay. My, this expresses love. Little. Helmer thinks his wife to be little, like a baby, having no sense to understand what she should do. And feather brain. Okay. Feather brain is a person who is nothing but a mat, having no sense. He, she or he is a fool. This is how Helmer respects his wife. What is a marriage? In this drama, Henry Gibson redefines marriage and love. Marriage has to be between two persons of equal oaths. Marriage has to be between two persons of equal oath. Marriage has to be based between mutual understanding, mutual respect, mutual, mutual, mutual a trust, okay, mutual love. It is not that only you will love and she will not love you. 
It is not that only you will respect and uh, he will not respect you. That is not. It has to be based on mutual understanding. Understanding means there has to be a kind of understanding, not a kind of, there has to be a good understanding between the husband and the wife. A marriage has to be based on mutual respect. The husband will respect the wife, the wife will respect the husband. It has to be. If the husband does not respect his wife, how can he expect to have respect from the wife? A marriage has to be based on mutual trust. You must trust your wife. If you always suspect your wife that you are an opish and your wife is perhaps doing something at home, if you are suspecting your wife in that way, then a marriage cannot be an abode of happiness. But we find that kind of relationship between Helma and Nora. And we find that kind of relationship between thousands of husbands and thousands of wives. Marriage seems to be here a bond between two bodies. It is not a bond between two souls. It is not a between bond between two spirits. Okay. There is no mass between the intelligence of the husband and the intelligence of the wife. It is just a physical relationship, not any spiritual or ideological relationship between the husband and the wife that we have. In, we have a famous novel that is famous like John's House, okay, written by Arkan a uh, um, dark room. There is a good similarity between a doll's house and a dark room. In our continent, we have such a story. There, Shabitri finally says that there is not much difference between a wife and a prostitute. There is not much difference between a married woman and a prostitute. Only the difference between a prostitute and a married woman is that a prostitute can change her man, but a married woman cannot do that. Both, their, both of them earn their livelihood in the same way. Shabitri earns her livelihood not by dint of her merit, okay, by virtue of her body. She is serving her husband and that is why she has a lodging and a pudding in her husband's home. He needs her only when he is feeling physically, uh, he, he, he is feeling the arts of physical needs. Otherwise, he considers his wife to be as important as um, the maid servants in that novel. And here also, Nora finds that. Nora does not find any difference between her and um, the persons I'm referring to. Okay, this is how women are treated by their husbands in the society. So little my spend feather brain. These little my and feather brain, this is very important. Supposing I borrowed a thousand crowns today and you made drugs and breaks of them during Christmas week and then a New Year's Eve, a tile blew off the roof and knocked my brains out. Suppose I borrowed some money from somebody and you made Jacks and Drakes with that money. Jacks and Drakes means spending money irreasonable, unreasonably, irrationally. Okay. Suppose I have borrowed money from somebody and you have made or played Jacks and Drakes with that money. Then suddenly I style blew away from our neighbor's roof and hit my head and I died. Helmut did not utter the word that I died, just he uttered. The knock my brains out, and Nora hurriedly goes to put her finger on the lips of her husband so that her husband does not utter the word that if he dies. That is what your wife will also do. If you go to say that if I die, your wife will come to put her finger on your lip, don't utter that word, don't say uh, you will die. Nora also does that, lying her hand in on his mouth, harsh, how can you walk so? Hari, hari bully. How can you talk of death? Don't talk of death. Okay. Helmar, by supposing it were to happen, when then? Suppose it happens, then what will you do? 
Suppose I borrowed money and it happened. What will you do then? No, no, if anything so dreadful happened, it would be all the same to me whether I was in debt or not. If it happens really, then it will no matter to me whether I borrowed money or not. Okay. No? Helmer says, but what about the creditors? Then what will be the creditors? You borrowed money and then I died. You are saying that it will not matter to you whether you borrowed money or not. It will be the same. So what will be the creditors? Nora says that who cares for them? They are only strangers. Who cares for them? The creditors are only strangers. If my husband dies after borrowing money, I'll not pay back the loan to that person. I will not care for the creditors because they are nothing but strangers to me. Helmar, Nora, Nora. Again, Helmar is getting angry when he sees that his wife is behaving in that normal way. What woman you are? What kind of woman you are? But seriously, Nora, you know my principles on these points. This is the line that you may quote while you were writing your answer, okay? So Nora, you know my principles on these points. No dates, no borrowing. I have this principle and I always follow it. I always like to cling to it. No borrowing, no date. Home life ceases to be free and beautiful as soon as it is founded on borrowing and date. Home life ceases to be free and beautiful when it is founded on borrowing and date. There cannot be any peace and happiness in a family that is found on borrowing. So don't borrow money from anybody. Don't lend money to anybody. That is the philosophy of Helmer. And Nora has been living with this Helmer for 18 years. So she knows very well that my husband will die but will not borrow money from anybody only because of his impractical principles. Okay, Nora, that is why I borrowed money without telling him. We are to have, sorry, we do have held out bravely till now and we are not going to give it at the last. We have been following this principle for a long time and we will never give in it when at the last. Nora, going to the fireplace. Very well, as you please, Torvald. Okay, Torvald, I will do as you please. Finally, the woman has to come down to agree with the husband. Even still now in our family, the last word in the decision is said by the husband, not by the There may be a quarrel, that may be a part debate between the wife and the husband over an issue, but the last word in the decision is said by the husband. Never. A decision is taken by a woman in a family. The decision is taken finally by the husband. And the wife finally has to come down to flow with, to go with the flow. Okay. She will have to come down to agree with what her husband is saying. You see, it was a kind of debate that was going on between the husband and the wife. And now Nora is coming down to agree with what Helmer says. Okay, my dear husband, not very hus dear husband, very well, very well, as you please, Torfan, okay, I will do what you like, as you please. That means Nora is getting sulk, Nora is getting uh, angry with this insistent or consistent persistence of her husband, okay, she is getting angry. Very well, as you please, Torfan, Helmer says that his wife is getting sound. And now he comes close to Nora to dispel her tarsiness, dispel her anger. Just to bring her back to her good mood, Helmer comes close to her. Come, come, my little lark must not drop her wings like that. Look, come, 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 come. Again, he's using that phrase, come, come, that is used to express annoyance. Helmer is annoyed also. But still, he's coming close to his wife to bring her back to her jovial mood, to dispel her half. Half means A C double F. Like a woman, bola hai. Okay. And I come, come, my little lark, my little lark must not drop her wings like that. What is my squirrel in the sulks? Look, 
is my squirrel in the song is my squirrel in the amar kadbira liki khub rag bollo amar kotha shone shami tar stri ke ebhabe sambodhon kore tar man bhangate chesta korche amar kadbira liki khub rag bollo amar kotha shone is my squirrel in the songs and checks out the parts nora what you think i have here helper knows how to bring a woman back to her jovial mood helper knows what a woman wants to have to be happy helper knows what can make a woman happy helper brings out his parts and shows it to his wife helper says nora see what i have in my hand helper has brought out his parts and is showing it to his wife saying that nora see what i have in my hand nora turning round quickly and nora is turning round quickly all anger of nora is gone all of tasiness of nora is gone all half of nora is gone nora is turning round quickly money you have money in that purse helmer there gives her some notes of course i know all sorts of things are wanted at christmas helmer gives some notes to nora saying that i know many things are needed at this christmas so you need money and look how nora is counting the money nora counting 10 20 30 40 10 20 30 40 nora is highly happy when she has got 40 taka 40 taka it is completely unimaginable it's a fabulous amount of money to a woman 40 taka my grandmother not my own grandmother okay um she was the grandmother of my distant cousin she had 300 taka and she always felt that she had the greatest treasure in her possession she had only 300 taka and she did not find a safe place in her home to keep that money what she would keep it she had got 300 taka sometimes she was hiding the money in 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 a jar or in the pot of rice sometimes under the blanket sometimes in the cover of the pillow okay she was restless with that great amount of money that she had she had only 300 taka it's a great amount of money women don't have as money so 300 taka is a large sum of money to a woman just 20 years back even still now to many women 40 taka is a great amount of money but 40 taka one needs to just take tea outside nora is very happy when she has been given on the 40 taka 10 20 30 40 nora seems to be dancing nora seems to be walking on the air she feels her head touching the clouds when she has been given 40 taka a great amount of money she has been given women do not have money and this lack of money makes women subordinate and weak in our society this lack of money leads women to indulge all humiliation torture from their husbands if women had had money women would not have faced this so what women would have to have to feel strong in this male dominated society to have a source of income if she does not have then she will never be able to be herself she will have all her freedom in her hand if she has money what's the wolf in her famous seminal essay a room of my own has said woman needs to have a room of her own and some money to be herself a woman cannot be herself a woman has to be always somebody else she has to be somebody's wife she has to be somebody's daughter she has to be somebody's mother she has to be somebody's sister and she would have to live a life designed by them she cannot live a life that she likes to live okay it is her life so she knows what she will uh, she will need it is her life she knows better what she will feel comfortable with but always the comforts of women are architect uh, are designed by men okay her husband is chosen by her father her home is chosen by her father her dresses are chosen by her husband 
today our women have the opportunity of going to market to buy dresses but three or 50 years back dresses that husbands were buying were the good dresses to buy they are dresses so everything of women that means the happiness of women was designed architected by their husbands so here we find this so women do not have much money when nora has been given money nora comes back to her happy home. nora's anger is very much like the flash in the pan it cannot last long a wife's anger cannot last long. A wife's anger is like the vibration of a bell. It is very much like the flash in a pan that goes away yeah, within a second when the husband gives her something. And many husbands know the mechanisms of making their wives happy. They know what things their wife will take to become happy. Helma comes and gives her some money and she is coming back to her jovial mood and becoming very happy, feeling that her head is touching the clouds. So she has been given 40 taka, money, and look 40. Oh, thank you, thank you, Torvald. This will go a long way. Thank you, Torvald, thank you very much. You have helped me a lot. This will go a long way. Helmut, I should hope so. I hope that it will go a long way, Nora. Yes, indeed, a long way. But come here and let me show you. Let me show you what I have been buying. Come here. I want to show you what I have bought. And so see, I have bought all things, cheap things. Nora has bought. Look, there is a new shirt for Ivor. Look, there is a new shirt for Ivor and a little sword. There is a sword for Ivor because Ivor is a boy, their son Ivor. So Nora has bought a sword and a suit for her. Here are a horse and a trumpet for Bob and she has bought a trumpet and a horse for Bob who is also a boy. And here are a doll and a cradle for Amy and she has bought a doll and a cradle for Amy because Amy is a girl. Look, even we make discriminations between toys that we buy for, for our girls and for our boys. Our boys learn their duties even from the toys that they play with. Our girls also learn their duties even from the toys that they play with. From their childhood, they know that they are women. From their childhood, they are oriented with their tasks. They understand gradually what they have to do when they will grow up. What is this doll doing? This doll is perhaps sitting, drawing a long, if it is a Bangladeshi doll, then it will be sitting like a piece of a statue with its long veil drawn before, covering her face. Or what is that? This doll will never ride a horse. This doll is never uh, ride a bicycle. This doll will never have a sword in its hand. This doll will have what? Perhaps a broom in her hand or a winnowing fan that we call cooler to sort wheat from the chaps or it is sitting like a piece of a statue in, uh, in a showcase. So this is the image that she has been gifted because she is a woman. So we have to reconstruct our choice to dispel the differences between men and women that we have in our society. Otherwise, women will not be able to be what they like to be. Even a little toy that we buy at the cost of five taka teaches a girl that she will have to be like that. She finds a similarity between her and the dog doll because this doll, this, this, this toy, this toy resembles her. She resembles the toy. This toy is very much like her figure and she learns what she will have to do when she will grow up from what the doll is doing here. So we have to reconstruct our toys if we want to eradicate, emancipate women and eradicate differences that we have between the men and the women in our society. This is how we bring up our children in our family, in our society. These are the social discourses that always tell women what they will have to do, what 
the shoot actually. And Nora, look, and then, sorry, they are only common, and but they are good enough for her to pull to pieces. This, and finally, you will see that Nora has not bought anything for her. You will read these lines, and you will see that Nora has not bought anything for her. This is very important. Nora has bought cheap things for her sons, for her daughter. And she has also bought a gift for her husband. And she's saying shamelessly that all these things are cheap things. She uh, bargains with the shopkeepers until her cheeks go red. Okay, and shame. Because she will have to save money. Nora has not bought anything for herself because she has saved money by not buying anything for herself because she would have to pay back the installment every month she is paid installment of the loan that she took from <coughs> Pakistan. Elmer does not know. Elmer only says that the moment he gives money to his wife, the money goes out of her hand. And that's why Elmer calls his wife, I spend thrift. That means uneconomical. She seems to be very uneconomical. She cannot have the money in her hand. The moment she gets money, and the moment she spends it, the money does not seem to stay in her hands. She is called a spendthrift. Nora does not mind. Nora is saving money in this way to uh, pay back the loan that she took from Pakistan. So Nora is doing all these things for the family, but the husband does not know anything. The husband only sees that the money does not stay in the hand of his wife. Husband calls him, calls her a spendthrift, blames her by calling her a spendthrift. Even a little later, you will see that Helmer is comparing Helmer to her father, saying that you are very much like your father. Your father was always on the lookout for money, and he put his hand on everything that he got close to his hand for hate, for, for close to his hand for money. And you are very much like your father. You have inherited the quality of your father. You are also uh, very much expert in spending, spending money. But Nora actually does not spend money. Nora saves the money to pay the loan that she took from Pakistan to save the life of her husband. So Nora is doing something virtuous, but Helma does not see this person and misunderstands his wife and this misunderstanding is a common thing that happens in our family we do not understand why you do not understand why your wife is doing that perhaps your wife is doing that for your benefit but you think that she is not doing that and for not doing that you are blaming her so women are always sacrificing but men do not see that sacrifice rather they think rather they go to criticize blame them for that sacrifice that they are making for you. This is what Henry Gibson has brought before the notice of the male, that women are sometimes victims, even, and women are sometimes held guilty of some things that they are not guilty of. We don't, we find, we sense even sins in their verses. That is how male dominated society treats women. And come to page number uh, 14. This is page number 14, the last line, the last turn of Helmer is saying, you are a strange little being. You are a strange little. We look at the word little. Helmer again and again using the word Helmer. And the reputation of this word has significant meaning. Henry Gibson very um, intentionally use this word little here. This little is symbolic of the little names of women that men think women have. Okay, Helmer always thinks his wife to be very little. Little means intellectually little. Not having much sense to understand what she should do. <coughs> you are a strange little thing, just like your father. 
always on the lookout for all the money you can lay your hands on but the moment you have it it seems to slip through your fingers you are very much like your father your time is nearly look when your husband compares you to your father for a verse for a good thing that can be tolerated but when you are compared to your father for a bad thing that cannot be tolerated you can digest your humiliation you can digest your own insult but when your father is insulted indirectly by your husband in law that is very unbearable that is very shocking that's very painful for no reason helmer goes to compare nora to her father saying that your father had that bad habit so for this bad habit helmer has found a similarity between helmer and sorry between nora and nora's father and he's referring to that thing comparing his wife to her father for that thing it's really shocking and unbearable the husband behaves in this way with his wife then nora come to the dialogue of nora nora i wish i had inherited many of papa's qualities i wish look at the sentence nora is saying i wish i inherited many of the qualities of my father nora is proud of her father and in presence of her husband she says that she wish she could inherit many of the qualities of her father this is how a daughter loves her father helmer and i don't wish you anything but you just what you are my own great little songbird and my dear wife i want you to be very much like what i want you to be my little songbird don't go to be like your father be like what i want you to be every husband wants to mold his wife in the way he likes so helmer is saying that don't be like your father be like what i like you to be my little songbird look at the expression of his laugh my little songbird amar chotto ganer pake tumi tomar babar moton hobe na amar moton hobe ami ja boli sheti bishwas koro believe what i say do what i say be what i like you to be like don't go to be like your father don't go to inherit qualities of your father after marriage you are under my guardianship so you have to inherit the qualities that i have that your husband has but i say it is strikes me you look so so what shall i call it so suspicious today uh, you are looking very suspicious today what you have done that you are looking so suspicious nora do i you do indeed i look me full in the face okay look at me in the full face i want to see you are looking very suspicious helmer has seen that his wife has eaten macaron and that is why he's saying that you look very suspicious today you are not looking at me when you were talking you were standing with your face down look at me in the full face nora looking at him well helmer threatens with his finger hasn't the little sweet tooth been playing pranks today and helmer threatens with his finger have i not told you not to eat macaroons that will spoil your teeth and you have done that again in defiance of my order okay helmer is threatening his wife that you have eaten macaroons in defiance of my order how can you do that helmer nora no how can you think such a thing helmer didn't she just look in the confectioners nora no told that really helmer not to sip a little jelly nora not certainly not helmer hasn't she been nipped a macaron or two nora no told that indeed indeed helmer well well of course i'm only joking i'm only joking but i suspected that you ate macarons so helmer had to tell a lie sorry nora had to tell a lie finally to save herself from being perhaps beaten by her husband if her husband could understand that his wife ate macarons in defiance 
of his command, the might of it and had and Nora I had to tell a lie. And Helman is satisfied now that his wife did not eat any macarons in the confection areas. This is how Helmer loves his wife. I will tell you to read the whole drama. Okay, I, I'll give you another class on it, and you will see how uh, much Helmer loves his wife. Okay, and how much love actually you find true love, genuine love. Helmer's love is is actually as genuine as a three dollar bill. I told you. Okay, he actually does not love his wife. He he needs this wife only for his personal benefit. Papa, okay. your time is going up. My time is up, but okay, my class is also up. My class is also up. He, this is how, but still you have to understand one thing. It is not that men do not love their wives. There are many examples that will show you that husbands love their wives. What Henry Gibson is saying is not altogether true. Just a few days back, you have seen in this COVID-19 pandemic, a wife, a husband was carrying his wife over his shoulder and carried few miles with his wife on his shoulder. Is it not love that he carried his wife with his shoulder? His wife could not walk. If he had not loved his wife, he left his wife there. I would not need this wife. I'll get a new wife. He will stay here and be affected by coronavirus. He did not do that. He carried his wife on his shoulder. And he walked a long distance. I want to give you another example. In Bangladesh, Tazreen governments, you might have heard the name of this government. It was set on fire once. Okay. And many died, many workers died there. A boy came from Rangpur here to find out the dead body of his wife. His wife worked in this factory. He had been ransacking among the ashes of the dead bodies to find out his wife. And after two days, SARS, he found the skeleton of his wife. He identified seeing a bracelet that he gifted her. Okay, and he found that bracelet uh, attached to uh, that skeleton. And he found that it was his wife's skeleton. And he was laughing. That picture was captured by a journalist and it was published in daily newspaper. How happy he was getting back the skeleton of his wife. And he carried that skeleton to his village home. He would bury the skeleton of his wife in the, in the graveyard close to his home. Perhaps when he would go to a field, he would look at the graveyard in which his dead wife is sleeping. If he had not loved his wife, what would he do with that skeleton, burned skeleton of that lady who was his wife? Is it not love? He loved his wife. He loved his wife again. Perhaps he also used to beat his wife. He loved his wife. You know government workers? Okay. He loved his wife. It is absolutely his love that made him carry the skeleton of his wife to his place home. And if you could see that picture, you could understand how, how happy he became when he got that skeleton of his wife. It is really, really love. It is love. That means he loved his wife, but at the same time, he used to beat his wife. Because this man has always believed that beating wife, rebuking wife, eh, is a part of his manly duty to cut uh, his wife down to size. Our religion even has taught us, our tradition has taught us, our everything has taught us that we have to keep wife under our control. If men had even understood that they should not behave in that way with their wife, they would not have behaved. So it is not actually the man who is responsible for this. It is our culture. It is our structure that is responsible for this behavior of man towards their wife. If anything is to be held responsible for this, it is our culture that has to be responsible. My culture has taught me that I have to behave in this particular way with my wife. I've learned it from the people around me. I've learned it from my father. I've learned it from, from from different things that I come across every day. So this culture has to be reconstructed in a different way. That will teach me to be sympathetic, to be to be to be to be respectful towards women. Okay. Baba, your time has gone up. Okay, thank you. My time is gone up. Okay. 
my son is again and again demanding me. Thank you very much for today. Um, uh, you will have the textbook in the next class in your hand when you are attending the class. Uh, we'll complete this drama uh, next class. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, sir.